Good afternoon, everybody. It's just turned three o'clock and we have an hour broadly on the subject of food, water, carbon and nature. How can it all add up? And what I thought I'd do is just uh, share a few reflections from my perspective as the chairman of Natural England and also as a long-serving environmentalist with many different uh, experiences in relation to these subjects over many years. And then we can have a conversation, Q&A, uh, whatever, uh, to test any ideas or to, to dig into things that maybe I, I didn't cover. So um, we reach an interesting point on this long journey of, of, of sustainability it's become known as. And uh, I think it is literally 30 years ago to the week, if not to the day, uh, that the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit concluded. And that was the moment when the world really did begin to wake up on the connected crises that were beginning to become apparent then, but which have now taken on really quite visible dimensions. And the one that perhaps is most visible, certainly in the media and in our day-to-day -day experience now, is the climate change challenge. Back then in 1992, it was still debated pretty actively and quite fiercely as to whether there was even any evidence as to there being a problem in the first place. Quite a lot of people said it's sunspots, it's nothing to worry about, it's perfectly natural. But of course, since then, we've begun to see the consequences of rising average global temperatures. Last year, the temperature globally was 1.2 degrees warmer than it was in the pre-industrial period. Would you believe that all seven of the warmest years that have ever been recorded were since 2015? And if you just think about that for a second, that was seven years ago. That says something about the pace and the rapidity with which now conditions are changing. And this was in the climate models 30 years ago. I remember very well, I was a campaigner at Friends of the Earth at the time, and we had uh, a set of projections coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change using quite rudimentary models compared to what's now available. And they said by about now we'd see concentrations of CO2 causing the kinds of shifts that we're seeing. Actually, on some agendas, uh, ice melt, for instance, we're way, way ahead of what the modeling was saying in terms of the speed with which this is unfolding. 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now. We've not seen that level since the Pliocene, three to five million years ago, when sea levels were about 75 meters higher than they are now. Very big change, which is now beginning to alter the conditions that we experience. And the climate piece, of course, is now being caught up in the public mind with the loss of biological diversity. It's now beginning to get more and more traction. Uh, some people call it the nature crisis alongside the climate crisis. I think that's probably a good way of explaining it. It makes more sense to more people. Uh, biodiversity is a, a slightly more complicated word. In fact, the, the BBC did a, 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 a vox pop a few years ago. They asked random members of the public in the street uh, what they thought biodiversity was. And the single biggest answer was, it's a washing powder. That's what people thought. Obviously, we need to do some work on the basics of the communications. And in fact, this is maybe one reason why it's taken three decades to get to where we are now. But the biodiversity piece or the nature crisis, there's different manifestations of it. Uh, the uh, loss of species diversity is, is possibly uh, the uh, most dramatic. Um, one million species now estimated at some risk of extinction uh, by the intergovernmental science policy platform on ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, that's the parallel expert process alongside the IPCC looking at the state of the natural world. Uh, they say, they conclude that we're at the beginning of a curve of extinctions which will match the five previous moments in Earth's long history when there's been an, an annihilation of life. The last one occurred 65 million years ago. It was the time the dinosaurs disappeared. Alongside the loss of diversity is the loss of abundance. The Living Planet Report, which is produced by WWF, uh, tells us that we're now 60% below the number of vertebrates that were living on the Earth in the early 1970s, getting on for two-thirds reduction. 
uh, in the numbers of birds, reptiles, mammals. And that is something, of course, which gets worse each time those reports are published. And then the third level of nature emergency is the loss of ecosystem function, seen in things like the, the carbon that's escaping from the natural world and into the atmosphere, uh, the decline of pollinating insects, uh, disruptions in hydrological cycles, and so on and so forth. Now, what's interesting about all of this uh, is until quite recently, certainly back in Rio, and, and until quite recent past, a lot of people who were running major corporations, uh, running uh, countries or in finance ministries, they thought that these environmental challenges were the price of progress. They were regrettable, loss of animals and plants, but inevitable, because what we have to do is to grow the economy, increase the uh, availability of resources to end poverty, create jobs, and all of the things that we know go with the kind of e economic system that we've embedded over the last 70 or 80 years. More recently, however, there's been a realization that actually that was completely wrong. And if we don't halt and reverse these environmental trends, then there will be very serious consequences for our social system, for our economy, and in some of the worst case scenarios, threats to our very civilization. If we don't peak emissions very quickly and then begin to reverse the damage that's being caused, and if we do not begin to repair the damage that's being caused to ecosystems. And so all of these things begin to come together. Uh, the ecological system meeting the economic system, meeting the social system, then posing questions as to how we begin to piece together some kind of a rational response. Um, and part of that rational response has to be a shift into systems thinking. I don't know if people have heard that phrase before. Uh, we had uh, a mention of this a few times on the panel a moment ago with the Secretary of State. Uh, we were sitting there together with Minette Batters from the National Farmers Union and Natalie Bennett from the Green Party, and all of us were agreeing that this shift into systems thinking is now absolutely critical in terms of what we must do to find solutions to these problems. And so systems thinking is really, it's quite a straightforward idea of seeing the connections between different things and managing them together. Because what we have historically done uh, in terms of our response to environmental questions is we try and solve them one at a time, often with quite a technical response coming in uh, to do something about water pollution or something uh, to do with carbon, but only in one sector of the economy, like renewable electricity. Or we try and do something to slow down the loss of nature by creating a protected area, or something like that. The systems level approach takes us to a step above and starting to look at how we achieve multiple objectives through joined up action that can bring together different tools, different competences, different resources, to hopefully push in a, in a complementary direction across different sectors, if that makes sense. And just to kind of give you a, an idea of how we're now trying to play this thinking into the work at Natural England, I'd like to talk a little bit about you know, the connections between food, water, carbon, and nature, and how it can all add up. So you will notice that quite a lot of policy making been going on um, during recent times. Lots of really quite exciting stuff, actually. So one that was being talked about earlier is the so-called environmental land management policy, ELM. So this is one of the uh, schemes that DEFRA has been working on. It's come um, on the back of the departure from the European Union, a very strong political drive from the Secretary of State to make the most of the Brexit opportunity by coming with a new policy. And one of the things that is positive about the opportunity there is effectively redirecting um, what were payments for managing land, uh, which was the EU policy for agriculture, and instead redirecting those subsidies into managing land, not only for sustainable farming, but also to reflect a wide range of other services that society needs, clean rivers, recovery of biodiversity, and public health and well-being benefits, and reorienting the uh, financial resources to pursue those environmental outcomes as well as being able to um, protect our food supply. And the idea was kind of um, predicated on the notion of paying for public goods. So public goods is, is a term economists use, 
And it basically refers to those things that societies need, but which you can't buy in the shops. So you can buy food in the shops. Therefore, from an economist's point of view, a public good wouldn't necessarily be food. But what you can't buy in the shop is a clean river, carbon being captured in the soil, uh, the recovery of the corn bunting population, and so on and so forth. And so redirecting the subsidies to correct that market failure actually is quite a good example of understanding the limits to what economies can do without some level of alignment with the environmental uh, outcomes that society wishes to achieve. And so ELM is kind of working in that space. And we've got the three schemes now at different stages of development. So the sustainable farming incentive, we heard a bit about that today, um, which is seeking to encourage uh, more sustainable practices within the field or within the farm landscape. Then the local environmental recovery policy, which will be looking to do something similar to what we currently do with countryside stewardship, which is to uh, improve features like grasslands and ponds and uh, woodlands in, in farmed areas. Uh, and then the landscape recovery scheme, which will seek to achieve landscape scale change. So, you know, hundreds to thousands of hectares uh, moving into, uh, for example, wood pasture kind of landscapes may still be producing some food, uh, but doing this in a way which is going to be maximizing some of those other ecosystem benefits we need, carbon capture, purity of rivers, recovery uh, of wildlife. And that's the explicit aim of that particular scheme. So we've got that beginning to come into play now, the sustainable farming incentive just starting to come through. The other two schemes in development, landscape recovery, um, just receiving a first round of applications, local nature recovery we will see in development and then deployment hopefully by around 2024. And we have countryside stewardship in, in the meantime. So we've got that. Uh, we've also got, of course, um, the uh, biodiversity net gain tool coming through. Um, this is uh, something that's been talked about for some time, and actually in some economic sectors, like the mining sector, for quite a few years, they've been talking about the way in which you might be able to compensate for damage in one place by repairing the environment in another one. And so this scheme uh, is now underpinned by legislation in the uh, 2021 Environment Act, and this then will be rolled out over the coming period, requiring people who are building houses or developing infrastructure to have a measurement of the biodiversity before they implement their project, and then to be paying for uh, equivalent biodiversity plus 10% to be created somewhere else. And this is deliberately set up as a market mechanism. And you see the Environment Bank down the um, uh, aisle there, just by the, the top end of the, of the exhibition. Uh, what they're doing is effectively working with people to create habitats that can then be bought by the people who are building the infrastructure and the housing, thereby uh, creating an incentive for people to want to um, have more biodiversity and to get paid for it. An awful lot of complexity in that, I can tell you, uh, but Natural England is working to advise government how best to deploy this and will be um, supporting the policy as we go forward. So we've got those two things, they're quite new. Uh, we've got, of course, the existing protected area network. Uh, so for 70 years in, in this country, we've been declaring sites of special scientific interest and national nature reserves. We've got quite a lot of them. I think about 8% uh, of England now uh, is uh, declared for reasons of, it, of, its, um, uh, of its significance for, for, for nature. And we're still declaring more of those. And indeed, what we're trying to do increasingly is to reflect the uh, conclusions of, of Sir John Lawton's report published in 2020, 2010 called Making Space for Nature, which really set out the idea that if we wish to halt and reverse the decline of nature, we're going to need more protected areas. They've got to be bigger. They've got to be better quality and crucially connected to one another. And so we've just embarked on a, on a new phase of activity at Natural England, two new phases of activity, actually. So one uh, is around the uh, use of the existing national nature reserves and trying to make them bigger and connecting them up. Uh, and we had what I think is a landmark uh, step on that in May this year with the declarations of the Somerset Wetlands National Nature Reserve. So that um, is uh, 6,000 hectares, so 60 square kilometers. So in old money, what would that be? About 25 square miles. It's not, it's not a tiny one. Uh, what it's done is, is to bring together six existing NNRs 
um, mostly quite small ones, and to try and fill in the land between them and to connect them at a larger scale. There's still work to be done down there because that wetland area is considerably bigger. But this is a step in the right direction and follows uh, a declaration a couple of years ago on the Isle of Purbeck in Dorset where we put together three national nature reserves to create the Purbeck Heath Seminar. Uh, that one's about 3,000 hectares. And opportunities then to introduce large herbivores and to start putting back ecosystem dynamics that you couldn't do in the three previous smaller sites, but in the bigger one, with the bigger boundary, um, uh, we can have beavers, we can have pigs, we can have cattle, all of which will be contributing to the diversity of the landscape in ways that previously weren't happening. And the other step in a similar vein, which we also announced uh, last month, is the so-called uh, identification of so-called uh, nature recovery projects. And so these are larger areas um, in, in involving not only protected sites, but also farmers and water companies and others working in those landscapes to be uh, cooperating at quite large scale to be able to do what Sir John Lawton's report said. So we've got that uh, also in the mix. Another piece we've got, which is um, quite happily coming uh, forward now as people understand the connections between nature and climate change, it is investment into the recovery of the natural world for reasons of carbon capture. Uh, so uh, the Nature for Carbon Fund is a new tool that government is working with to prioritize two sets of, of activities. One is the establishment of more woodland cover, more trees in the landscape, and the other one is the protection and recovery of peatlands uh, to be able to hold carbon uh, in the ground. Uh, actually, by far the biggest natural carbon store in this country is peat. Everyone gets very excited about trees, um, but actually it's the peatlands which are bigger. And actually, Manette Batters on the panel just now, I can't remember if she said it on the panel or just before, but some work the NFU has been doing uh, is identifying vast carbon stores in grasslands. Uh, in this country and you know the extent to which that's underappreciated and I think very often you know the trees they kind of draw our attention to the above ground carbon when actually a lot of the discussion at this conference and, and this meeting is about the below ground carbon which in many instances is far far bigger indeed um, carbon uh, in the soils is, is, is vastly uh, more than all the carbon uh, above ground and in the atmosphere as well actually so this is something that requires more attention and you know the, the nature of a carbon fund is one way into that but of course linking this to agriculture is something which, which is work in progress and which we need to see a little bit more structure around I would say if we're to make the most of that. So all of these different things um, are coming together um, at once and also on top of all of that actually we've recently had this realization that access to the natural world is really really good for people. Uh, so the extent to which we might be able to take the edge off of some of the public health trends which are causing real concern now, uh, both physical and psychological. Uh, obesity is mentioned very often in public health discussions. So is um, anxiety and depression. Both of these things are costing the National Health Service a lot of money, uh, but both of them can be made less bad at least through greater access to the natural world. And we discover that actually those benefits, those health and well-being benefits, they accrue in a disproportionately big way to the most disadvantaged groups in society. So there's actually a leveling up dimension there too. Uh, if you start looking at the ways in which uh, creating opportunities for more uh, time in the natural world for people with lower incomes and lower um, opportunities, actually it does them more good than the rest of us. So there's quite a lot um, also to be seen from the public health side. And this is still gathering momentum. At Natural England, we're working now on um, various uh, dimensions of so-called social prescribing to be able to create the connections between the public health and the nature side. Um, but again, you know, another area where we can see a little bit of policy convergence. So all of this is kind of leading me to think, you know, we've got a lot of different things now that we could be using, uh, plus also the private finance. Um, that's the other kind of economic piece which is coming into play and linked to the soil carbon, a lot of interest already there as well as the, the woodland carbon. So the question becomes, how do we start to pull all these things together? Because if we're going to have a system change, we kind of need to notch this up a bit and draw the connections between these different pieces rather than simply assume each one on its own is going to go off and do good. And so how do we do that? 
Well, there's a couple of thoughts that um, are um, already in, in play and which at Natural England we're seeing is very much at the heart of what we're trying to do. So one thing um, is the idea of building a nature recovery network. So this is something that was in the 25-year environment plan, another very important policy document published in 2018. And that one um, set out the aim of creating a so-called nature recovery network, put some numbers on it, 500,000 hectares of new habitat outside the protected areas over the 25-year life of the plan. We think, actually, we could do much better than that. We could go way beyond 500,000 hectares, and people are already putting into effect quite a lot of different things that are contributing to that number. You know, the, the work going on at NEP, the work going on at Wild Ken Hill, it's outside the protected areas, very much, um, however, going in the direction of achieving that goal. And we can put much more momentum uh, behind all of that. Uh, so this is really at the heart of what we're trying to do at Natural England, but using all of these different tools to be able to make it occur uh, in a, a much more strategic and structured way. So rather than dissipating the biodiversity net gain and the elms investment and the tree planting and the protected areas across the landscape, um, could we do better by pulling them into a coherent way of looking at them uh, as a toolkit that is contributing to something beyond what they can individually do. So that's the, the task at hand. This is very, very far from simple. But if you look at the resources and the policies now um, coming onto the table, if we can do that, we're going to get much further down Sir John Lawton's vision than we would just randomly putting these things out uh, in, into the landscape in a way, which you know may do some good, but wouldn't do as much good as it could do. So the Nature Recovery Network is pretty critical to um, this project of nature recovery and doing that in a way where we're going to be able to uh, deliver uh, net zero and also at the same time deliver some level of climate resilience. And actually, the thing I forgot to mention, which is another huge budget that government uh, will deploy in the coming years, is the flood budget. Should we be using that to be creating more wetlands and rewooding hillsides rather than building concrete defenses in vulnerable locations? It's never simply either or. But if we're more sensible about the most cost-effective use of that in terms of meeting multiple outcomes, you know, and the flood budget could be used not only to be um, reducing flood risk, it could also be cleaning up rivers and also catching carbon and also providing public access opportunities and, you know, creation of wetlands, protection of peatlands, you know, are two areas where you could see that happening. So if you put that alongside the other tools that I've already mentioned, you know, you can see quite a rich mix coming through. Now, the thing is about government that I've discovered, and I spent much of my time working in NGOs, and I spent quite a lot of time working with, you know, quite big global companies, uh, and actually, they all suffer from the same thing. So this is not a poke at government without recognizing it to be a wider problem. And the wider problem is, of course, is that we work in silos. Everything is being run by different groups of people. There's a group of people who are doing trees, there's a people, group of people doing flooding, there's a group of people doing agricultural policy, there's somebody else doing climate change, there's somebody else doing nature, and there's a whole different department doing public health. So this then becomes a question of how we start to knit these things uh, into a coherent whole. And uh, this is something that, of course, is work in progress. But the first thing I would suggest in relation to solving any big problem is that at least you can describe it. And so that problem of siloed delivery, I think at least if we recognize it, we've got some chance of being able to get our arms around uh, doing something uh, to, to solve it. And so that's where um, we are at the moment, I, I would say, ladies and gentlemen, just in terms of a, a broad summary as to the journey we've been on. Uh, we are in a period of rising awareness. It's taken quite a long time to understand the implications of this biodiversity and climate change, nature and climate change emergency that we're in. Um, it has led to a large number of initiatives and tools in the private sector, the public sector, the NGOs, different businesses beginning to respond. Um, but the challenge we now have to face is how we deliver at systems level. So how do we start stitching together not only an understanding of the problem and the interconnections between carbon, food, nature, and water, but also start to stitch together how the solutions can work together at scale as well. And perhaps we can now spend a little bit of time discussing what we might do, having reached that point. And uh, as much as I like to have all the answers, 
I hope that some of you have got some as well. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> time is it? <laughs> Quarter past. Half past. Thank you. Yeah, good. Got half an hour, so um, plenty of time, and we don't have to use the whole half hour if you get bored. Um, lady there, please. <laughs> Um, just following up on what you were talking about in terms of um, siloed thinking and um, systems thinking, complementary thinking, all of those things that were talked about quite a lot in the previous session, um, land use is under significant pressure from so many different directions. One particular example of where there seems to be conflict between policy, particularly between departments, is nitrate offsetting, which, um, coming from the southeast, we've had a lot of work on over the last couple of years. So we have the requirement under planning for um, new housing projects to have to offset the nitrate that they're producing, in summary, um, which is putting a lot of pressure on the delivery of house building, but it's also putting a lot of pressure on people to deliver solutions quickly. Yep. So it feels at the moment like they're taking the easy option um, of the options that are available by taking large areas of land out of production, which obviously under the current climate um, is putting significant pressure on reducing productive areas. How yep. do we avoid this conflict of policy that fails to achieve in dealing with the problem of dealing with waste in new developments, but erodes food production? Yeah. So um, for, for those not familiar with, with, with um, the challenge that's just been described, effectively in quite a lot of um, England, we now have a situation where new housing is adding uh, to the wastewater system in a way which is pushing the release of nitrates into the environment above a level that is um, uh, sustainable for protected areas. So we, we have basically, um, anyone seen the Solent in August or September lately, where it's bright green or parts of the Somerset levels that are bright green? The River Wye is a good example that's getting quite a lot of airtime lately with um, pollution going into that watercourse, turning it turquoise. This is a disaster for the fish and the aquatic life. So the question becomes, how can we line up new house building alongside the reduction of that, or, or at least not increasing that pollution at a level which is going to make things worse. And so this then has led to the idea of nitrate or nutrient neutrality. We've got phosphates in there as well. And so the idea of nutrient neutrality uh, basically um, requires developers to come forward or come forward in partnership with planning authorities with plans that can say, if we build these 500 new houses, the nutrients in the system are not going to be any worse. And so then you've got various options for um, dealing with that. And so this is where some, uh, some of the reaction has been in terms of retiring land from agriculture and putting it into um, effectively um, nature conservation or into, into a wilder state. And what this does, it means that there's no nutrients going into the agricultural land anymore. Uh, so that's a reduction. You may have some nutrients being taken up by vegetation that's growing there, which is another reduction. And you can add up the amount of nutrients, and you can say that's 500 houses worth or 1,000 houses worth. But as you describe, it instantly becomes a land use question. And you know, then becomes really quite a conundrum uh, between quite a lot of different moving parts. And you know, the house builders, uh, some of them complain quite bitterly, why are you having a go at us when actually quite a lot of the nutrients in the system are coming from agriculture and also coming from road runoff, some of it coming from uh, industrial sources. And, you know, we're being singled out just because we're the last ones into the landscape, as it were. And so, you know, you kind of, um, at one level, you can see that, you know, that there is a real question there about, you know, how do we get a fair share of allocation of responsibility across the different sources, and this is work in progress, and people are thinking about that. Um, in order to solve the land use um, challenge, however, um, what we have to do is, is eliminate the, the sources of the pollution in the first place. And so, you know, ramping up of the quality of our wastewater treatment system, that would be an obvious place to go. You may have noticed over recent decades, not so much lately, it may come back, however, um, there was a big debate about the cost of living and the price of water. And the price of water is determined by water companies' investments in their assets. If you're going to invest in more in wastewater treatment, then it's going to put the bills up. And so, you know, that's a debate. It's a political discussion. It's not a policy uh, that we run at Natural England, but it's one that people do need to think about in terms of how we approach this particular challenge. And so uh, this is in the price review 
of Ofwat, another government agency that looks at the proposals of the water companies on a five-year cycle, and they come forward saying, we'd like a new reservoir, we'd like a new distribution network, a new water treatment uh, works, etc. and Ofwat decides on what is the um, right level of investment. And so there's a question there, and one might expect, you might expect, considering the public concern about the quality of rivers, that we will see an increase in investment there. And so that would be more in the longer term solution rather than just retiring land from agriculture to catch nutrients. And so there's a solution there, solution in inverted commas, because it, it's going to take a while. The other thing we could look forward to, I hope, uh, is the deployment of the new farming policy in a way which is going to protect rivers. And um, one of the things which I think is, is a sensible policy uh, I don't know if anyone's quantified what it would do to river quality at the moment, but we could look at it, would be to take a 10-metre buffer strip either side of every major watercourse in the country and basically take that out of, um, out of production and have that as either grass or woodland next to the rivers. And I, I don't know if, if we could do some modelling there. Um, we, we should check to see if we can do that. Um, some countries, you know, Brazil, the United States, places I've worked over the years, you know, very clear rules that apply to entire landscapes, 20 metres either side of the river, you don't touch it, it remains natural. And that helps to protect those ecosystems, obviously. Whether we could do something like that here, that's something to look at. Um, but the wider implications in terms of, you know, reducing uh, fertiliser use would be uh, an obvious step. Actually, quite a lot of people here, I'm sure, are thinking about that right now in terms of, you know, focusing on soil health thereby being able to rely less on, on um, manufactured fertilizers. There's definitely something there in the mix. The other thing I saw the other day, which I thought was really interesting, was a piece of technology that's being looked at for a new housing development near Gravesend, which effectively is um, a, a closed loop system. It's basically taking the sewage and wastewater, treating it on site, and then putting the cleaned water back into the toilet flushing system. So this is when the housing development is being built. So you probably could retrofit it. It would be more complicated. But this development is looking to be super sustainable, super green. And they're incorporating this technology into the uh, site from the get-go. I think that's 2,000 houses, that one. And basically, it will mean that everything is treated on site. And they're also looking at how they might be able to use methane capture off of the sewage sludge to be able to generate a bit of electricity or heat as well. Um, that stuff... Again, slightly over the horizon, but these are the kinds of places we need to look. I mean, that system's thinking right there, literally changing that system, uh, so um, intervening at the beginning. But, yeah, you, so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm scratching the surface. You've put your finger on a really big subject uh, and one which gets people very exercised because, you know, the um, demand for housing is huge, especially in the south of the country, and this is a challenge uh, which, which is going, you know, right into that tension between, you know, meeting environmental targets and meeting housing targets. And ideally, what we do is both, rather than trade one against the other. Excuse me? And food production, exactly. Yes, quite, exactly. Whole system's right there. Thank you. Um, please? You need a microphone. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Uh, I've got two points I'd like to um, ask you to talk on. First of all, the concept of agrivoltaics. So um, that is when solar is being put on the ground, which I, I don't believe in, but when it, when it is, to make sure that there's some form of agriculture being used at the same time, so you've got mixed use. And then secondly, it's a, a little bit more complex, but the uh, number a couple of years ago, the double burden of malnutrition turned into being called the triple burden of malnutrition. And this was because micronutrient deficiency entered into that. And micronutrient deficiency is coming from the food that we're eating because broccoli today is 20 times less nutrient deficient than it was 30 years ago. And that's coming from the soil. So if we can improve the soil health, we will improve the food health, soil nutrition, food nutrition. But what we're measuring at the moment or what everybody's trying to measure is soil carbon. And I would like to see yeah. your views on the ability to measure... Yeah soil active carbon and yeah. soil active organic matter because right. it's the yeah. active element of the soil that actually yeah. allows the plants to take yeah. the micronutrients and the microbes to do the work to make that happen. Thanks. The active part being the living part, the, 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 the micro, yeah, micro Yeah, the living bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. all of what Merlin's yeah. chatting about yeah, down the good. road. 
Yeah. Well, actually, you know, the, 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 it's just on your first point about the energy and, and the, you know, the agrivoltaics. Um, yeah, we really must be doing that. You sometimes see sheep walking amongst um, photovoltaic arrays. I thought we could co com call it combined meat and power, uh, if, you, if you kind of look at it like that. Um, you probably could do something a little bit more imaginative with horticulture as well. Um, the first thing, and I, I said this earlier when, when we were in the other panel with the Secretary of State, the first thing, I think, would be to put it on buildings, actually. Uh, you know, I, I came in yesterday evening uh, I, I, into West London on an aeroplane, and um, there is this vast landscape of logistics warehouses and buildings just near Slough. I'd never seen it before. It's absolutely huge. I couldn't see any photovoltaics on it. There are these massive rooftops, and yet... I get people telling me about, you know, grade one agricultural land in Kent being targeted for, for solar PV. You know, so that, that, that is, you know, food security and, and energy security. These are both big deals. And trading them off against each other isn't really a sensible thing. We need to do both. And that's going to require a much more systems way of looking at it and, and moving the photovoltaics to where it's not going to be taking land. And if you do have it in a way where it's, um, you know, uh, in the landscape... Not only can we look at trying to get you know some food out of it, but also the, the biodiversity benefits can be enhanced as well. And I saw some work a few years ago um, suggesting that if you put them like six or seven feet up rather than low down, and the way you space them and orient them, you can get quite a lot of vegetation underneath and then insects and everything else. So there's good practice to be to be harnessed there for sure. Um, on the soil piece, um, yeah, we've become obsessed with carbon now, haven't we? It's like you know it, it's what. It's kind of been building for a while, but it's now really located as a discussion amongst quite a lot of different groups in, in the farming world, in the policy world, NGOs, financial sector now involved, of course. And um, it's, it's, it's helpful insofar as, you know, that's a discussion which is adding to, you know, this kind of joined up narrative. Uh, but the wider soil health piece, um, not so much. And, you know, I don't know much about the pathways between micronutrients and microorganisms, but soil health, I would assume, would include some level of, of understanding of, of the biodiversity of the microbes and, and the biomass of them, and also the hydrology of the soil. That's the other thing which hardly ever gets talked about, is the extent to which you know, aquifers are being, are being uh, replenished through water percolating through from above, and the properties of the soil often are quite important in determining that. So whether there's something that could go above, include carbon, but go above and have some measure of wider soil health. I don't know if anyone is looking at that yet. Um, I don't know if any of the Natural England colleagues, it. Rob, if you want to stick your hand up at any point on some of these questions where I'm probing the edges of my knowledge, um, we, we might, yeah, please, please do feel free. Um, but yes, health versus carbon, they're different. Yeah, yeah. Um, so gentlemen there. Thanks very much. Thanks for your overview at the beginning. It was excellent. Um, Thank you. Bill Hurditch from Sydney, Australia. Um, I was at COP26 in Glasgow and I was astounded that agriculture was not even, well, hardly mentioned, farming. And we know for sure that um, grazing management that's well done can sequester carbon. All we hear about is, is, is the problems of livestock rather than the benefits. There's really good evidence for... Uh, my question is going to be, how can the UK government ensure that COP27 has agriculture as part of the solution rather than the problem? Yeah, that's a good question. I've, I've not been close to what's going on, but we're the president, we're the president country until COP27. We hand over the baton at the beginning of the meeting in Egypt. And um, the British government, you know, it did try very hard uh, to bring these kind of less talked about questions into COP26. And so I think there was some progress. Uh, the nature piece and the extent to which you can't solve the nature crisis unless you do the climate crisis and vice versa, that got in there. Big piece on forests. I think you're right about the food and agriculture side. It was less prominent, but I don't think that was to do with, with lack of trying. I think, I think uh, the British government did try quite hard on that. Um, but it, you know, it, it certainly does need to be there, but also it needs more literacy amongst the public to understand some of this stuff. I just had a little chat with Minette Batters from the Farmers Union just before we went on the panel there uh, this afternoon. She's quite frustrated about, you know, this attack on, on the livestock sector. You know, there, of course there are issues with livestock, but there's issues with everything. 
I mean, some of the plant-based alternatives are worse than livestock agriculture sometimes. And so that's not really being um, thought through. It's like, you know, no meat vegan. It becomes a slogan, and it starts to lose a lot of the nuance. Do you want to come back? Back on that one uh, as well. Um, there, there's a, a really interesting papers showing that the evolution of grazing animals and grassland expansion coincided with a, a significant cooling in the climate yeah. because of the what you said earlier about the b below ground biomass yeah. of, of deep rooted uh, rooted yeah. grasses. So there's a whole lot of stuff there that yeah. we need to be tapping into rather than just using agriculture as a whipping whipping horse. Definitely, uh, you know what you know is is it's kind of. Animals, you know, uh, cattle uh, in particular, and sheep to an extent, you know, they take land, uh, they produce methane, therefore they must be very bad for the environment. What people sometimes um, fail to appreciate in that kind of simple chain of logic is how this planet had many billions of ungulate grazers until quite recently. And the difference between the ungulate grazers of the Pleistocene compared to the ungulate grazers of today, is that the ones in the past, they didn't have fences around them. And they were creating a very different dynamic with their environment compared to quite a lot of the animals that are caged now for human purposes. And also, of course, they weren't being fed soya beans from deforested landscapes. But they were performing really quite profound biological functions, as you're describing, including creating grasslands with vast amounts of carbon in them. And replicating that is what we need to do rather than saying that all livestock agriculture is bad i was just looking over the hillside there as we were walking around earlier as i heard a shorthorn cattle down there and they're kind of concentrated in a bit of the field and i just wonder if this farm is uh practicing so-called um mob grazing have you heard of this fellow from zimbabwe i've forgotten his name savory, savory alan savory um who researched this and discovered this incredible transformation when you encouraged animals to be grazing the land in a way which would have uh, been the, the kind of ancestral wild grazing pattern, which effectively is the animals turning up for a day or two in a spot, absolutely hammering the vegetation, leaving a vast amount of dung, and then moving on, often pursued by predatory animals. In Africa, it would be lions and hunting dogs and cheetahs. And the animals are constantly moving. And they may not come back to that place for 18 months or two years, by which time all that dung has created a massive fertility event in the soil, the bi biodiversity in the ground has exploded, the vegetation has shot up, and the roots of the grasses, the perennial grasses, have taken vast quantities of carbon into the ground. And some of the pictures that Alan Savory showed, it might still be a TED talk there somewhere online you can see, where he practiced this mob grazing in quite a degraded landscape, and the rivers started to run again. It's an incredible set of consequences. And again, the soil health linked to the hydrology as well as the carbon and all the above ground biodiversity. And that stuff, of course, you miss all of that if you say we've got to go vegan. The conversation has ended before it's even begun. And so what can we do to replicate some of these functions of wild biodiversity in agricultural landscapes? And, you know, that mob grazing piece. I know there are people across this country now trying that. And uh, it'd be good to catch up, actually, and see what the experiences are. But for regenerative agriculture, you know, the incorporations of animals into a mixed farming system, it, it just seems to me to be something that we have to keep very much on the table rather than... Pardon me? They do do it. Okay. Cool. So lady said they do do it here, and we can see it this evening. So gentlemen there, and then lady over there. Let's go, go here first, and then we'll go over there, and then, then there. How are we doing for time? Um, thank you, Tony, for that uh, yeah, very insightful talk. Um, you rightly pointed out the importance of uh, access to nature for uh, physical uh, and uh, mental health. Um, do you accept that there's a tension between environmental protection and public access, and also tension yeah. between food production and public access? Yeah. I'm thinking particularly of you know, the... the uh, uh, problems that were encountered by many farmers during the lockdown when, yeah. when access to the countryside was much increased. Yeah, the, on both counts there is a tension. and I, I think the tension in relation to nature conservation can be really, really quite a big tension. I was up on the Norfolk coast a few weeks ago um, near to Blakeney on Blakeney Marsh and there was a chap way out uh, in an area where there's nesting red shank 
and he's got his dog off the lead and it's bouncing around. There's birds coming up all over the place and it uh, utter disaster at that time of the year when those things are nesting. They've got eggs and chicks. And you get a similar picture from different parts of the country. Um, I mean, the, the, a couple of things that you, you could say about that. One is awareness. Um, you know, people really should have more knowledge when they go out with their dog into a place like that, that they need to keep their dog close to them and not walk out into the marsh themselves. So there's a public education piece. Uh, there might be, I, I don't know if there's any law or bylaw there that says you can't do it, but maybe there's some of that uh, as well. Um, uh, and the other bit is, is about the design of places like that. You know, some places I go where, you know, people do walk with dogs and some of them are not necessarily very ecologically minded, uh, but the reserves have got kind of ditches and features that basically keep people away from the wildlife without the people even really noticing. And so, you know, you've, you've kind of got ways of being able to manage this, um, but it is an issue. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't say this means we've got to ban people going into sensitive areas. Um, I think that would be going too far. Um, but then again, I really don't think that we should say everyone can do what they want in these beautiful wild places. We've got to find a way of integrating the nature recovery and the public access. And that requires people to accept, you know, some limitation. The, this right to roam thing is kind of up again at the moment. I see kind of campaigns running. And um, I think it's quite a small minority of people who want the right to roam. Uh, I think probably the bigger job is getting the vast majority of people who don't go anywhere to roam a bit on footpaths and do it in a responsible way. So I think, you know, if we are going to be encouraging access to the countryside, it's probably most usefully directed at people who don't have any access or no kind of knowledge of where to go and encouraging them to do it in a responsible way. On the food side, you know, same things. It was livestock, wasn't it, with dogs, gates left open, crops being trampled. Uh, we did quite a lot of work at Natural England to promote the Countryside Code, which had some of these kinds of basic messages in there. But it's big work. Uh, going to take a while, you know. And it's in some senses, you know, we're kind of um, reaping the kind of consequences of a, of a society that's become utterly disconnected from the natural world and where our food comes from. You know, the idea of walking through someone's crops and, you know, whatever, you know, what does it matter? I mean, you kind of have to have no knowledge of anything much to do with agriculture and farming to think that's okay. And for your dog to be running around next to curlews on eggs, you know, again, you, you need to be pretty disconnected from how the world is to, to see that as being something that's acceptable. So there's a massive public awareness campaign needed there. Uh, and how that goes and how, how that comes, I don't know. But um, it, th there is a big element of it. And, you know, some of it starts at school, in fact. You know, nature education for kids in primary school, do we do much of that anymore? I don't think we do. There's a GCSE in natural history coming now, which is great news. But I think a lot of this stuff is, you know, it's basic cultural kind of awareness. And I think a lot of that, you know, we need to be building it in to, to where people get their ideas from. And, you know, they first get their ideas about some of these things from, you know, early years at school. So maybe there's a place there for some of that. There's a lady over there. Um, Hello? Can you right, thank you. My heart is racing. I don't know where to begin. You're talking about Neither so many um, important practices here. <laughs> and um, we're tenant farmers, mainly to the National Trust. We've been farming organically for the last 22 years. As somebody who works for the government, are you aware of how appalling the current farm business tenancy agreement legislation is? You talk about basic cultural values and how to implement all these terribly important practices, the current FBT legislation is really not fit for practice. We have been, one could say, possibly model tenants over the last 23 years, absolutely mob grazing, suckler herd, vegetables in the so-called arable fields, farm margins, rich, rich biodiversity. We're really proud of the agricultural practice we've brought into it. Absolutely um, school visits, um, no question, very proud of that. We were served notice to quit oh. two and a half years ago. We are legally trespassers. That's national trust. Now they tell us, oh, we'd really like you to stay. But do you know that these people who go to Sirencester, I don't know if any of you trained to Sirencester, um, charter surveyors, it is in law protected legal jargon to serve notice to quit when a tenancy agreement is coming up for renewal. Um, so FBTs are obvious, honest, quite often for just two or three years, and this includes people's homes. So those with tenure of, I understand you might know, 
a third of the land farmed in this country is tenanted. Does anyone have any better figures than that? No, I've heard something similar. So a third. In yeah. order to get these agric agricultural practices in place, best practice, climate-friendly practice, cultural, yeah. correct practice, so absolutely children are connected with nature and where their food is coming from, it will never happen under the current FBT law. Yeah. Serving notice to quit. So people with tenure are being asked to leave, not just their homes, but their livelihoods, their businesses. The idea of actually employing people, having the confidence to employ people and build this rich rural economy in touch with nature is a shambles. It will yeah. never happen. The National Trust need to be investigated. The Charity Commission are not interested. We live on the edge of a village and hamlet. A third of the houses in that hamlet, all owned by the National Trust, are empty. You talk about a housing crisis. If the National Trust actually rented out all their cottages, there would not be a housing crisis. They own, are they the second largest landowners in this country? Um, possibly. Um, they might be the biggest. And I don't nobody know. Ministry of Defense is maybe. taking this seriously. Yeah, thank and you. And somebody within government needs yeah. to look at this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm very sorry to hear you've had that kind of experience. I'm not an expert on that. Rob Cook, uh, our um, <laughs> program manager on food and farming and fisheries. Rob, I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's too late. <laughs> Do, do you have a view on this, Rob? Because I, I, I've heard similar complaints, but I, I, I don't know um, what the remedy could be. We, we just be, you know, Natural England, we're the government's advisors on, on nature, so we touch some of these things. But this is very much a DEFRA question you're raising, but Rob will have some knowledge, I'm sure. I think I'm just losing my voice, actually, Tony. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's re really, really helpful to hear. Um, and we're, we're about to, we have just submitted evidence and we're about, Tony and I are about to have a discussion with, with Baroness Rock, who's leading a, gov a review into tenancy oh, arrangements. Right, yes. So there is a review underway. I can't, yeah. I can't give you any yeah. answers to your, yeah. your particular challenges, yeah. but it is recognised that things aren't as they should be. Yeah. So that review is underway. Um, gentlemen here and then there. And then I think we're probably going to be thrown out of this tent for the next event. In your presentation, you, you use the words clean um, up rivers. Shouldn't you have said clean out rivers, and then that would have solved a, flood, a lot of the flooding problems that we have? I see. So, um, so the sense of clearing the channels to, to, to get trees and stuff out. So, um, so this, is, this, is, this is a complex subject, and some of the um, work that I've looked at over the years um, suggests that more naturalized rivers actually are a better way of reducing flood risk than cleaning out the channels to um, enable water to move more quickly from A to B. And so um, the idea of slowing the flow is something that hydrologists increasingly talk about in relation to flooding. I actually saw a paper the other day that came through looking at the impact of um, one of those last winter storms um, in Norway compared to Scotland and the flood events that followed. Which one was it? It was U um, Storm Eunice, I can't remember, one of those two last winter. Um, and it, it went through with a very heavy rainfall. And um, there was a paper reviewing the flood peaks and the damage that came in the wake of that. And it compared, as I say, Scotland with Norway. In the Norwegian example, the rivers are more natural. There's more woodland, and it's natural regenerated woodland rather than plantation. And the flood peaks were much smoother there compared with Scotland, where you've got bare hillsides and rivers that have been you know, very often canalised uh, in order to move water. And you know, you've got peatlands there where you've got drains dug into them deliberately in the past to get the water off the hillside. So um, you know, I'm sure in some cases we can mitigate local flood risk by making the channels smoother and quicker and deeper. Yeah, I'm sure in some cases that will be the case. Uh, but what I think we have neglected uh, is that wider view of the landscape and the character of the landscape and the character of the rivers, which I think there's an increasing body of evidence available to show us that actually, if you're slowing the flow down by more natural processes in the catchment, you've got much less likely uh, going to suffer from a flood. And the other thing to bear in mind is when you dig channels deep and straight, you're moving the water more quickly, but very often you're moving it to a place downstream where you're going to cause a bigger flood than the one you're avoiding here. Do the whole thing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's a policy that we'll be embracing at Natural England, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, though, for the question. Um, gentlemen here. 
<laughs> Sorry, just just a quick one on your um, the silos that you are talking of. Um, I'm from the heritage sector, and Elms has uh, I understand some some funds going towards heritage because a, a hedge is yeah. an is a, an indication of man's involvement in yep. the landscape for often centuries. Yeah, and same with historic buildings, etc. So yeah. just some reassurances that that is on your agenda would be great. It certainly is, and coincidentally, this April um, we had a very high-level meeting at Natural England with our colleagues at Historic England, and we um, spent some time exploring together the synergies between protection of the historic environment and the natural environment. Um, one of the things we've discussed at the Natural England board um, has been, you know, the question of actually what do we mean by nature recovery? And so, you know, some people hear us say that, and they think, oh, well, they're talking about insects and birds and plants, and you know. Actually, it's wider than that. And so what we now say we mean is four things by nature recovery. So one is the biodiversity and the birds and the insects. The other is the natural beauty of the landscape and, and the character that, you know, inspires people. And, you know, it's in art and literature and everything else. The third thing is ecosystem services. So maximizing the carbon capture and the hydrological services for rivers. And then the fourth piece is the historic environment, which often is the reason why that place has the character it has anyway. And so you look at the Yorkshire Dales National Parks, for example, and some of the landscapes there, the upland meadows, um, good example of all four things at once. Outstanding biodiversity for um, plants, insects, and birds, uh, those upland hay meadows. Um, it's a beautiful landscape designated as a national park. Uh, it's also helping to reduce flood risk in York, not, notwithstanding what was said a moment ago, by holding water in the landscape. And the fourth thing it's doing is maintaining an historic landscape. Because if you left that, if you did rewilding in that landscape, you would lose it. It would go to woodland quite quickly. and You wouldn't have that anymore. So by protecting all four values in the same place, you get something which is um, bigger than any one of them. Again, it kind of goes back to that kind of joined up approach about how we approach these challenges, uh, I think we can say. Um, final question, I think, by the sound of it. And then we're running out of time. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm in a mid-tier scheme. I know a lot of people who will not go into a mid-tier scheme because the administration of it is a nightmare. Do DEFRA understand that when it comes to ELMS, they need to dramatically simplify the administration? Um, so this is something I have heard repeatedly. It's something that we have said to DEFRA, haven't we, Rob? So Rob is our main person who speaks to the DEFRA policymakers. Um, Rob, again, would you like, I don't know if there's anything to add just in terms of, you know, where that discussion has gone, but we've heard it and we agree with that. So, Yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 it's a, a very familiar story um, and everyone, DEFRA ourselves, are determined that the new schemes will be much less administratively burdensome. So, yes, and, and the regime needs to change, and I'm sure it will, from one of penalty to one of encouragement. So, yeah, and I would encourage you to join a scheme, actually. Yeah, good. Excellent, thank you. So Secretary of State said the same thing in the panel earlier on ab about moving from bureaucracy to outcomes, about the process being needing to be more flexible. I think everyone can see the sense of that. Yeah, great. Um, so was there a final one? Just over, just final quick one if we run to the back there and then, w then we better close because um, I guess there'll be something else coming in a minute. Oh, yeah, the gentleman there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, Again, building on the kind of integration of things, kind of the, the role of the local, the council, the nature recovery, local nature recovery strategy, I think it is, for a local area. Just be inter interested in your perspective on if that can help bind things together and perhaps keep people involved. Sorry, say again, I couldn't hear. Uh, sorry. The, building on your point about integration, yeah. I was thinking about the role of the local authority, the yes. local place, the local yeah. nature recovery strategies, I yes. think, exist or are coming. Yes. And what you might see is the opportunity for people to be really involved in yeah. joining things up for themselves. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So the local nature recovery strategies is key to the whole delivery of the nature recovery network. So this will be a new policy coming in next year, I believe, and which will be working at county level. So in this case, Hertfordshire, a process that will be involving everyone who wants to be involved. So landowners, land managers, uh, NGOs, environment agency, house builders, all of the different actors coming together to hopefully start crafting some plans that can target those incentives I talked about before for carbon, for protected areas, for agriculture, for biodiversity net gain, to start turning that into something which is more than the sum of the parts, as it were. So that is a huge opportunity. 
uh, and those will be rolled out by local authorities um, as of next year. We've got a team at Natural England working with local government on all of that, and so hopefully that's where we'll start to see some effect coming from all of these things that are being talked about. Thank you. So I think we'd better stop there. Thank you all ever so much for the questions, for listening. Hopefully of interest. Thank you.